I want to mention a couple other things. First of all, I am a member of Riverscape or Wabash River Development and Beautification Incorporated. In fact, I'm one of the founding members, but tonight I'm not speaking on behalf of Riverscape. So what you're hearing is my ideas and suggestions. Um, granted, a lot of these things that I'm talking about, we talk about at our meetings, but I just want to make that clear that that uh, Riverscape isn't necessarily endorsing my presentation tonight, although I do have some Riverscapers here in the audience and they will probably chime in on, on some of the things that I'll talk about. Uh, when I talk about developing the riverfront, I'm talking about the area basically that starts at the track and goes south down to I-70 and just a little beyond I-70. So we're talking about the east side of the river, mostly south of the river bridges. We've had lots of success on the west side of the river. That area has been set up to be more of a conservation area. So literally thousands of acres of wetlands, some trails, uh, bird sanctuary, butterf eventually a butterfly sanctuary, I guess it would be called. Um, overlooks, eventually a trail connecting West Terre Haute to Terre Haute uh, along the grade. And then the area north, on the east side, the area north of the bridges is mostly owned by ISU now and they've done some great things up there with the, with the track and a lot of beautification. And then you've got the Icon building, which is now uh, Riverfront Lofts. So we've had lots of successes along the river. The one area where I think we need to um, begin to focus is that area south um, from downtown down to I-70. So that's where I'm gonna be talking tonight. That's the area I'm gonna be discussing the most. <clears throat> Part of my advertising for the event was, have you ever said, there's nothing to do in Terre Haute? So how many ever, of you have ever heard someone say that, <laughs> right? How many of you have said it yourself? Uh, admit it, a lot of you have. So I wanna start off with a little bit of uh, just open, open forum here. When you say there's nothing to do in Terre Haute, what are we missing? What are the things you wish we had? And just throw something out. Anybody, get us started. Yeah. Okay. Water park, like lazy river, water slides, stuff like that. So a water park type of a space. That's one thing. Okay, so you're saying like a space for that or a an outdoor venue. Okay. So an outdoor vi uh, venue for charitable events and other types of events that could be rented and used and would be multi-purpose. Okay. What free, else? Free events. Free events. So things going on that you don't have to pay money to get into. Okay. Any other? Yeah. Interpretation of the river like an interpretation center or something that gives okay. the history of the river and its ecosystems. Great. An interpretation center for the river. Anything else? Just in general, just Terre Haute in general. There's nothing to do in Terre Haute. What do you, yeah, George? Uh, a walking area from Fairbanks Park all the way to I-70. Right. A trail from a, a walking path of some sort that, that you could take to get all the way from downtown to I-70. Okay. All-ages live music venue? An all-ages live music venue. Something we don't have that we really do need. Outdoor mall. Describe what you mean by outdoor mall. Well, you have restaurants, you have other activities. Mm -hmm. where it's just like uh, what the metals used to be before they put the cover over. Okay. Outside, okay. It's outside. And where people can blend in with the outside and, in, and uh, the outside and indoor at the same time. So there right. be a lot of different venues there. I went to it up in uh, Peoria and I went with a young lady that used to live there, and when they came back and saw all the activities on the mall, I mean on the uh, on the river, it was amazing. It was the Fourth of July, so it was on one side of the river and said all the fireworks were going on. Right. Amazing. Right. Yeah. How about a riverboat ride? A riverboat ride. Great. 
Back and back? Downtown. <laughs> Downtown? <laughs> okay. Something like river walks that some of these cities have where you have the outdoor dining, where you have shops, where you have things like some So it sounds like you guys are throwing me softballs here because all of these things that we're talking about are good fits for a riverfront. And we actually have geographically a great space for all of those things. So I, several of those I'm going to touch on here as I go through the presentation. Here's a few others that I thought of. Um, you mentioned eco tour. You mentioned uh, I, I call it eco tourism, but that includes interpretation and, and um, outdoor spaces. How about events on the river? So we do have a crew team now. But we could be having events on the river. I'm told that we have a long enough straight stretch that we could actually have competitions on the Wabash River. Um, I was out taking pictures earlier this week and saw hovercraft out on the river. Now we have had some hovercraft events here, but it's been a number of years. I don't remember when the last one was, but, but this is something we could be doing. Uh, did anybody ever ride Joe's airboats? Don't, don't you wish we still had the airboat rides? Right now, you have to hope that Brendan will invite you on his boat, because that's about <laughs> the easiest way to get a ride. Um, somebody mentioned dining uh, and potentially a floating restaurant, right? OK. Live music, water park. OK. So a brief history. You know what? We have um, this Art Spaces uh, initiative right now called Turn to the River. Why did we turn away from the river? So this map is 1880. Terre Haute was already a pretty good little city in 1880. The edge of this is about what is now 13th Street. Look at all those boats on the water. So there was a lot of activity here in 1880 even. Um, the reason that we turned away from the river really is because the river was filthy. The river became a toilet as Terre Haute developed. And so the industry was along the river because that's how you could get rid of your waste. And what a lot of people don't realize um, is that we didn't have any wastewater treatment in Terre Haute until the mid-60s. So when, when the Beatles came to, the, to America, we were still sending 100% of our sewage from everybody's houses directly into the river without any treatment. So, you know, it, was, it wasn't a nice place to be down by the water. It stunk. Now, what, uh, <coughs> that What's that? What date is that That's about 1930. And I had, it took me a while to figure this out. I'm pretty sure this is taken from the top of the courthouse. This is First Street. And I believe this is what they at that time, I guess, called Main Street. It's now would be Wabash Avenue. The street's not there anymore. But I'm pretty sure this is taken from the top of the courthouse. Is that? Our, most water, that's the water company. Yeah. This picture is, the, is Bauermeister Terminal, which became Distributors Terminal. That's just the best picture I could find with some examples of the industry along the river. So this would be just slightly north of the existing river bridges. And that, that rail bridge is still, you know, still there today. Okay. Well, the situation has improved a lot since 1930. Look at that picture. I mean, look at all the green. Here's an interesting note. This square right here used to be a spray field. And when commercial solvents or Mallinckrodt was over here, they pumped their, some of their waste under the river and sprayed it with sprinklers onto these fields. And that was, that was an acceptable practice. It was permitted for years. And actually, they were doing that until somewhat recently. Um, but as you look along, you know, along the river, what you see between, you know, between Prairie Road and the river, between First Street and the river, is you see a lot of green now. That certainly was not that way um, 80, 90 years ago. 
In the 60s, we built a wastewater treatment plant. That sure helped a lot. So whenever it wasn't raining out, there wasn't uh, sewage going in the river, except that there were still some industries dumping at that time. But that helped a lot. And, uh, you know, at this point, there is no industrial discharge anymore into the river. So any, any industry that exists along the river, at this point, their waste goes into a pipe that ends up at Terre Haute's wastewater treatment plant. Uh, the, last, the last place that was discharging that I, that I recall would have been about 2004 or 5 um, there at First in Washington. And they were supposed to be treating that on site and discharging clean water. Uh, as it turned out, they weren't. But um, at this point, there's, there is no industry dumping into the river anymore. Pat? Yeah? Can you say as much for upstream? I can't. No, I, I can't other than to say that um, EPA has clamped down enough that every community is dealing with this issue. I mean, we're, we're certainly not leading the way on this issue. We're probably behind a lot of communities. But, uh, but there, are, you know, there are still going to be days when Clinton is discharging sewage into the river that eventually floats by us. Yeah. Uh, and it, so tying into that, you know, the city of Terre Haute now is partway through this long-term control plan that will reduce uh, raw sewage going into the river. So just very briefly, we have combined sewers in Terre Haute, particularly in the older parts of the city where your sewage that goes out of your house goes into a pipe out in the street and the inlet at your corner goes into the exact same pipe. And at that point, the two are mixed together and you can't unmix them once they're mixed. So all that has to go to the wastewater treatment plant and there are times when the, when the plant can't handle all that, and when that happens, the pipes overflow into the river still to this day. But making a lot of progress on that, and, and uh, through this 20-year plan, which maybe we're halfway through, um, eventually those, those discharges will be infrequent, short in duration, and very diluted. So they won't have much of a negative impact on the river and, and it'll be just for a brief time. So all these are good things and it's allowing us to now turn to the river again. So real quick, I just want to run through who owns what along this corridor that I'm talking about. And first of all, all of that is publicly owned. So real quick, up here is Fairbanks Park. And of course over here is ISU. But Fairbanks Park, uh, the sanitary district owns this. There's a sewer that runs along here. The county owns here. The sanitary district owns here. And then the state of Indiana owns what they call the Oxbow. Just as a scale reference, this picture is about four miles wide. So this is a big area. And just to go through quickly the, the who owns what of the areas that are not publicly owned, uh, this right here would be Ohio Street. Okay, so the Ohio Street Bridge. Um, you got some properties along there that are privately owned. This was Inland Aquatics and this was the old, old jail. They're both owned by the same person now and, and he's a willing seller. You have the Thompson's Honda property, currently vacant, also a willing seller. You have Vectran. They are going to continue to operate at that location as far as I know. And then going past Fairbanks Park, when you get to the other side of Fairbanks Park, you have uh, this would be formerly Prox, and that's now owned by a company that makes uh, agricultural tile plows. Um, the city did purchase land behind them. But that is an active business. And then you have this large piece of property here is, depending on 
what era you identify with, commercial solvents or Mallinckrodt or Wabash Environmental Technologies. That, that property is currently not in use. I understand that most of the old um, works that the, the piping to treat waste there has been scrapped out and uh, that there's probably not much chance of that ever being put back to use in the way that it was formerly used. A uh, company called ChemGen owns this little corner here. And then as we go further south, you've got uh, the scrap yard up here. This is the sanitary district bought the back part of the scrap yard and got a half million dollar uh, cleanup grant to clean that side up through the US EPA. And then over here you've got, again, depending on your era, um, Western Tar or Rail Works. This is still privately owned, still owned by the gentleman that owned it when it was in operation. Um, it's going to require environmental cleanup. And I think that pretty much covers it. All, there, all of this was international paper and now is owned by either the sanitary district or the county. So, if it's such a great idea, why hasn't it already happened? Or why doesn't the private sector just do it? Here is where we get to my political philosophy, that government exists in large part to do the things that the private sector can't or won't do. And I believe that the fact that local government hasn't done much along this corridor is, is the reason that you're not seeing it being privately developed. And I'll explain what I mean by that. If you want development to happen, you have to somewhat buy down some of the risks for a developer. Developers take risks, but there are certain risks they're not willing to accept in my experience. One of them is after I buy the property, I find out there's a tar pit and now it's my problem. And it costs $2 million to clean it up. That's a risk that most developers would be afraid of. The other is I'm going to develop my 20 acres and then next door somebody is going to put in a scrapyard or a jail or some other thing that I don't think is going to help my business. So there's no protections in place for other, other incompatible uses. So the first step I, I believe in, in how we get development started in this area is there has to be a master planning process and that master planning process needs to look at what do we believe the best uses for this land are in the future and how do we set up a system with local government to help make sure that it happens that way. One of the things that you do is what's called a zoning overlay which means uh, there are a lot of ways that they can be done but you can say this right now is zoned industrial but in the future we would like it to be zoned um, residential multifamily or commercial or open space for a park and you create a series of maps through a planning process and then you ideally take it through your local legislative body in this case would be the city council to to make those maps official and what that does for somebody that is doing business there right now they can continue to do business as they always have but you're looking to the future and saying when that business stops, the future uses will need to change to these other uses or should be restricted in some way from certain uses. I, I'm always real careful about how I say that because what we, don't, what we can't do, what we don't want to do is zone somebody out of, their, out of their current use. You can't do that. So existing businesses need to be able to continue to do business. What we want to make sure happens is when that ceases, that we can move the property on to that, to that future use that we envision. Okay, then the next big thing, as I mentioned, you've got to get some environmental clearance on these properties. You've got to give developers some sense that when they 
put the first foundation in the ground, they're not going to run into surprises. There's a lot of different ways you can do that, but you know, in, in Indiana we have a brownfield program that you can voluntarily get into and they assist you through that whole process. Um, you know, that, that's what we did at Terre Haute Coke and Carbon. Uh, Pat Martin, former city planner, got eight million dollars to redevelop most of that property. There's still some of it left, but the money is out there, but you have to know how to go get it. So this also includes assisting private owners. So I mentioned the, the um, Railworks site. We know that it's contaminated. Um, a private owner has a, has a hard time dealing with that problem if their insurance won't clean it up. And sometimes you, um, them cooperating with the local government agency may be eligible for money that they wouldn't otherwise be able to get. And then a city needs to add parks and infrastructure to an area like this. So, trails and good roads. Um, Prairie Road is the frontage road for a lot of this area. It's going to need to be rebuilt. It's in bad condition. Uh, that was a state highway. It was given to the city um, seven, eight, nine years ago, um, and the state wrote the city a check for six million dollars for that, for taking that road over. The intention was that, that that road would be rebuilt. That never happened, but that's going to have to happen. And there's probably going to need to be, it's going to need to be widened. You're going to need to have a third lane in there so that traffic can make a left turn into these properties. Uh, this is a picture of the trail that runs south from Fairbanks Park. Now, not a thing wrong with, with that trail. It's, it's, a, it's a fine white rock trail, and you do see these all over the United States. But what is wrong with that picture? Yeah, I was wishing Amber Slaughterbeck could have made it tonight. You guys know Amber? She fights invasive plants. Honeysuckle. That's all bush honeysuckle. It's an, it's an invasive species, and it is all along the river, all the way from the bridges. And most, uh, men, you know, long stretches, even along the Fairbanks Park, you cannot see the water. So these were cleared, these areas, some of these areas were cleared several years ago, and they've grown back up. I mean, if you don't, if you don't spray the stumps and do that, it'll just grow back. So uh, part of you know, providing the green space and the trails is you need to provide the view shed for the people that have the per property behind this trail so that they'll have something to look at. Uh, connectivity and access. So, you know, there are areas where the riverfront is a long way from the road. So we're going to have to be thinking about how can we circulate car traffic closer to the river so that so that we get people down there, you know. We need, to get, we need to get more people knowing there's a river there and seeing it regularly. The other part of that connectivity that's, that I feel is really important is the pedestrian connectivity between downtown and the riverfront. Uh, US 41 is a major, major barrier. I think we need some kind of pedestrian bridge or something similar um, to get people over or even under US 41. They just don't want to navigate that six lane crossing. And right now it's a, it's a major problem. And, and the Turn to the River project that, that um, Art Spaces is doing um, comes through the government complex. And at one time that plan did have a pedestrian bridge as part of it. I don't think the latest version showed the pedestrian bridge. I mean, it's a big project, it's an expensive project, but I think it's an important part of making this all work. We really need to make downtown connect with, um, with the riverfront. And I'm gonna show some pictures of places I've been, and it's the same every time. You've got this main street through the downtown that points at the river, and there's like a T. There's people walking on the main street, and they're getting down to the river, and there's stuff going on both directions from that. Every, every city that I go to and look at at 
trails and riverfronts, I see the same thing. And then obviously utility availability, so we have to think about um, making sure all that's in place before development starts. And utilities are of course sewers and water, and, but it also includes things like um, high-speed internet and potentially continuous Wi-Fi. And these aren't even really hard things to do anymore, but we should do it before we start building a bunch of pavement, right? So I'm going to show you some examples of places that I've, I've been over the years specifically to study their riverfronts and trail systems, uh, starting with Eugene, Oregon. A bunch of these pictures were taken by Pat Martin. Uh, Pat and I and Coach John McNichols and Park Superintendent Greg Ruark did a couple treks out west. John knew of these cities that had these great trails systems along the river because he's the ICU track coach and he was going to all these places. So he basically took us out there and said, you have to see this. We were on the, the uh, river skateboard and it was just, it was a great experience. We learned a lot. Um, so what, you, what we saw, this is Eugene. Um, this is apartments. These would not be here if that trail was not there. Uh, this is just kind of a cool mile marker. That's what, that's what John's stepping on in this picture. Um, anybody here live at Heritage Trail Apartments? Everybody know where it is? It's out at the end of a dead end Locust Street, right? Would those apartments be there right now if there wasn't, if Heritage Trail hadn't been built out there first? And they named the apartment complex after the trail. So people do love to live along trails. And then you add the water feature and this becomes, this property becomes a hot commodity. Another thing I think that we're going to need is a way to get people between the developed side of the river on the east side and the natural side on the west. We need a bridge. We need a pedestrian bridge over the river. And in my opinion, it should be a signature bridge. Does that make it more expensive? Yes. But nobody wants to put their name on a boring bridge, right? <laughs> so you have an architectural contest, see who can design the best bridge, and then you find people to fund it. Or you go out and competitive, compete for grants because they're out there for projects like this. This is a suspension bridge, only for pedestrians, no motorized any, anything on there. This one's the DeFazio Bridge. It was built in 2000. Um, this is still in Eugene. Uh, Eugene, by the way, is, is bigger than Terre Haute, but it's not a rich city. It's a working class city. Um, and a lot of their trails were mulch or white rock or whatever, whatever they could put down to just get the trail down. Now these pictures happen to be of some of the paved sections. But some of the things that impressed me were they, like, Okay, we, we've got a road we've got to get under. You measure down eight feet from the underside of that bridge, and that's where your concrete goes. That's what you need, eight feet. You throw in some riprap, a railing if it's steep on one side, and you just get under it. You just do it. Um, the other thing we saw, this was a weekday, and these people were not, this person is not just having a pleasure ride. That person is riding to work. We saw a lot of that. People in basically dress clothes, you know, using the trail to get to and from work. Here's Boise, where we went the next year. Again, uh, the river is to the left in this picture. These are nice uh, little apartments with little, you know, back porches that look out over that. Then over here to the right, these pictures may have been taken on the same day. There's a lot of temperature change in Boise between, between morning and afternoon. Um, I think we got there and we were all in shorts and it was like, oh, hmm. But this was a restaurant, outdoor seating and indoor seating. I mean, I think that we would want a developer who would, who would put a, a restaurant on the river probably would want to have both, right? Because it's, it's pleasant outside some months of the year here, but they'd want to be in business year-round. 
Uh, just some more pictures just along uh, the rivers and waterways. Here's a section that was real steep. They put some railing up. We have some sections, um, particularly when you get to the river bridges and north, that if we had a trail along there, we would definitely want railings. There are some actually sheer drop-offs of 20, 30 feet in some areas along there. And here's their, you know, they had several bridges, but this was a kind of a cool uh, truss bridge that they had. Again, pedestrians only, or non-motorized only. And they just find ways around highways and things. And this was a pretty natural area other than this trail they had put in. Here's a couple other ways they were getting under roads. And you can see there's the water right there, and it's steep here. Put in a little retaining wall, get yourself eight or ten feet of width, and just get under there. There were lots of places we rented bikes one day, and there, there were places where I thought, boy, I wouldn't want to stand up while I'm riding my bike. Be, it would be pretty close, and I'm not a big guy, but, you know, they did what they needed to do to get, to get people around car traffic. So you could, you could do a whole stretch of river and never have to deal with car traffic. Here's Denver. I was there last year, and these are both apartment complexes, you know, so doing creative, cool things along the river, too, with new construction. A lot in Denver, a lot of areas that weren't, that where the trail went, that the areas adjacent were left natural. It's kind of cool. Um, two different types of bridges in Denver. This one on the left went over a rail yard. And it was a big area up here. It was almost a park in itself up here over the rail yard. And on the right, a pedestrian bridge over a busy highway. Another example of just a, just a simple way of getting underneath a bridge, some riprap to hold the slopes. And that last one on the right, what's that? It's a water park. So they thought the riverfront would be a good place to put a water park. And then just a few weeks ago, I was in Austin. A lot of the trails in Austin are this um, rock surface, kind of a fine rock. What I was most impressed with in Austin was just the sheer traffic on these trails. It was unbelievable. This was a weekday and it was just hundreds and hundreds of people on that trail the whole time. We walked three miles and went across and back. It was just just people everywhere. And uh, a nice overlook that just got you out over the water a little bit. I think um, Turn to the River is, is proposing something a little bit actually nicer than this, but similar to this, between the two river bridges um, on the Wabash. Uh, there were lots of places in Austin where there was a bunch of elevation change, and they dealt with that in different ways. So here was a stairway, but then behind where this picture was taken was a, was a ramp that did this. So it was still had handicap accessibility also. This was a neat um, trail map that had some etiquette on the side. So it explained if you're a pedestrian, if you're a bicyclist, what do you say when you're passing pedestrians, and what do you do with your dog and your dog poop and all that. So, um, so that was cool. So here are some ideas, and some of these we've already talked about. Why couldn't we do this now? We probably don't have a dock that's really suitable for it, but probably somewhere in Fairbanks Park would be a great spot for something like this. You know, we do have a lot of fluctuation in the river elevation here, so you have to design accordingly, but you know what? People have figured this out. That's, that's what engineers do. Uh, here was a concept back in 2015 that some engineering students at Rose did of a pedestrian bridge over US 41. So there's the courthouse there. Again, I think that we don't want to give up on this idea. I think we need to figure out a way to get people back and forth between the downtown and the riverfront. 
Madison, Indiana. Um, Marty and I, I engaged Marty. Uh, I asked Marty to mar marry me at uh, Clifty Falls State Park, which is near here. Marty went to Hanover. And 25 years ago, they didn't have anything along the river. You could hardly get down to the river. At some point, they decided their riverfront was something they should invest in. And they have a lot of cool stuff going on. This is um, street side history, it says. So again, we could be talking about, as we're going past the former uh, Mallinckrodt property, um, what's the history of that? What was produced there? Uh, where was the old distillery? Where was, you know, so there would be some opportunities for us to do that along the river. There certainly is a lot of history. Uh, here is a, a hotel now that is along the, the river in, again, in uh, Madison. I mean, why shouldn't we have a hotel on the river? It makes perfect sense. And again, here's, here's a restaurant that had indoor, outdoor seating uh, looking out over the river. I mean, you could see that, uh, something like that at the Thompson's Honda property, for example. I don't want to say that's the right thing to do there, but I mean, there's your US 40 bridge, right? And as you go to the back of that property, there's a lot of drop offs So you've got a lot of elevation. You can be looking down at the water. Could be a great view. So what are the next steps? Number one, we got to get the county and city cooperating to, redevelopment the, to redevelop the international paper property. It's the biggest single chunk, 66 acres. And the county owns that now. Um, my opinion, the city Devar department of redevelopment is probably uh, how that ownership should be transferred because they're in a better position to redevelop the property, being the Department of Redevelopment, and work cooperatively with the county to um, go through the process of a brownfield study on this property because we heard a lot when the whole jail thing was going on, but what I learned was they never looked into doing any brownfield assessment and there was a good chance that if they had done a study, they probably would have found some things. So again, probably that 60 some acres, a lot of it ought to go back into private hands someday. How's that gonna happen as long as there's that question mark? Well, that's a, that's a government's role, a local government's role is let's, let's get a clean bill of health for, for that property. Let's have a plan for how it can be reused. And let's potentially sell off pieces of the property and recover some of the cost of developing this whole riverfront, right? These are potentially really valuable chunks of ground. We need a new master plan for this corridor. Now, Riverscape did a master plan, it was completed, what, 2007? and um, they're ready to do another one. Uh, I'd like to see, because so much of that master plan has been achieved in the other areas I talked about at the beginning. Really, this is, this is the biggest uh, you know, remaining piece of the puzzle for Riverscape to really concentrate on, and I'd like to see the city cooperate. That means fund the plan or help fund the plan. And that means that when the plan is done, take that plan to the city council and get an official endorsement of that plan, which unfortunately didn't, didn't officially happen with the last plan. Um, and, but we need to make sure that happens this time around. We can immediately be developing trails along the river. We need people down on the river. So we have a trail, right, that, you know, here's the park, and there's this trail right now that comes along here, and then you get to right there, and there are these big concrete barricades, and you gotta turn and go back. But all this pink is owned by public entities. This 
Oxbow area, now it may have some restrictions on what can be done there, but just simply some trails I think is, is no? He's nodding his head no. Now there's, you want me to expand on that? Yeah, go ahead. That was a spray field. There's 206 acres down there. But the way it was purchased, you cannot develop any trails on there. But there is a levee that runs along there. It's really needs about four foot on average through there. And Bill Wolf and I walked it a while back. It would make a perfect trail. So people could go out there and make a path just like deer do. But to actually build an official trail, there's restrictions you can't do that. Okay. It's, it's underwater right now. So <coughs> yeah, and, and that's... It is a spring field. That's going to be true of some of these riverfront areas. You're going to have some times when, when areas down here are underwater too. And that's okay. You wait for the water to go down, you clean off the paths, and you're good to go. And the, these other communities I went to, especially in Eugene, they had areas that were in lowlands. And you could tell the water was coming up regularly. And they just dealt with it. You know, they just put down more mulch and... And, and go. So we need to, we need to get people, um, we need a loop and we need destinations. So not very many people are using this stretch because it doesn't go anywhere right now. But wouldn't be that hard to connect it up with the Holman Street Trail which starts right there, right? Wouldn't be that hard to have a trail that goes down here and the city has talked about doing trails around these, what were lagoons, are now just ponds. I don't know why that hasn't moved along, but you, know, you could potentially have a, a park here by the park and do a, a nice loop run or a ride or walk. That would be a nice you know, three mile or something trip. That would be, it could be very low cost and simple to do does not have to be a paved trail. But we gotta, we gotta get some stuff built and get people down there. And we gotta clear the riverbank so people can see the water. And then I think uh, the city needs to reach out to private property owners and, and offer to help with that redevelopment. Um, there's always a lot of fear with property owners that, that own property that could be contaminated they don't want to talk about it necessarily. They're worried they're going to get stuck with a bill or they're going to get in trouble or something. And we're going to have to break down those barriers and, and get them to the table to talk about how we can help them redevelop their properties. It's in their financial best interest, of course. Um, but in the end, there, we've got some chunks that are important parts to future development. You know, this Railworks property is, has a lot of frontage on Prairie and Road and Margaret Avenue comes up right here and there's a traffic signal right here. Wouldn't it be nice if that road could continue and, and have some kind of internal road back here and you'd have a nice signalized intersection to come out to. But until RailWorks is on board and we're moving towards cleaning up that site, that can't happen. Uh, one, more, one more slide. This is actually my favorite trail. Anybody know what city this is in? Trick question. <laughs> That's the National Road Heritage Trail. It is a jewel, folks. Uh, let's connect it up with more trails along the river.